Turn, please, to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Deliberately going to preach and not uh, reminisce or try to say a lot of things because it's one o'clock, so I'm going to read the scriptures and preach. Peter and Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Through sanctification, does that sound as bad to you as it does to me? Uh, my teeth are in, but it sounds as if they weren't. Uh, that, uh, where do you stand here? Any place at all? And the never, never two is different. Now I'll start again with verse two. He elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Incorruptible, undefiled, and that fate is not reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now, for a season, if need be, heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving even the salvation of your souls. Now I have in mind particularly verse 6. Ye greatly rejoice. The Bible is very sparing in its adjectives. And when it uses one, there's always a reason. He didn't say wherein ye rejoice. Or oh, this is an adverb, real, But it's a modifier. Uh, he says wherein ye greatly rejoice. So now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through temptations, but he didn't. He said manifold temptations. Now that's what I want to talk about. He said in verse 5, unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now these Christians look for a state of things, faith to them. To all the New Testament Christians, faith was not a nickel in the slot, pull down the lever and take what you want and go and write a tract about it. That's faith. But to the old, to the old Christians of New Testament times, faith was a telescope to far off. And oftentimes, death interrupted them while they were looking and they died with a smile on their face. Far off. And seeing the things that were to come, and thus they all died in faith. Now these Christians, Peter wrote, and Peter himself, looked for a state of things immeasurably better than anything that they knew then. It was to be that state, perfect and complete, and he that hath begun a good acted until the day of Christ. And it was to affect your body. 1 Corinthians 15 deals with that. But there's a time coming when we're going to have better bodies. We're a very body-conscious people. We even have a new called psychosomatic disease. Psycho means your nerves and mind, and somatic means your body. It's now that we get sick in our body because our mind is not well. And they, were, they think they've discovered something. And actually, John that 2,000 years ago and wrote that I pray that you may, your soul may prosper, your body may prosper, even as your soul prospers. He knew about psychosomatics long before these 
fellows from universities knew about it. And uh, we, they didn't, believed that there was a time coming. Paul wrote about it in a long chapter in 1 Corinthians, when he's somewhat like our own, but glorified and like Jesus Christ, and immortal so it couldn't die, and incorrupt, rot, and perfect so that you couldn't add anything to it, uh, like Jesus. And Paul took a whole chapter of that. I didn't used to read that chapter with any great amount of interest, but I'm very much interested in it lately, and I think you know why. Because I'm a little nearer now than the time when I first was running around these grounds with my hair black and in place have is gray, but uh, where the rest of it is, God only knows I don't. Now, not only was the body to be affected, mind and the soul also, John told us that, uh, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and we do not yet know what we're going to know this much. When we he returns and we see him, we're going to be like him. Now, that's all I ask for, my brethren. I don't ask for that. For that reason, I am not going to write any books on the state of the body in the glorified uh, condition. Because I don't know, very, but I know that if we're going to be like him, that will be enough for all the saints and angels and seraphim and cherubim for all time to come. And then in Romans 8, Paul tells us that even the earth is going to be better off. He tells us that conditions at that time are says. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption, glorious liberty of the children of God. So those Christians were looking forward to a time when he be purified and we should be delivered from the curses round about us. There'd be no tidal waves and no cloud birds and no forest fires and no polio and no cancer and uh, not earth. No, no memorial parks, which is the highfalutin name for graveyard. Uh, not that the whole creation, the earth and all its creatures, should be delivered from the groaning bondage of, cre uh, of death. And then society itself will be cleaned up. And the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters. And you know that those Christians lived, as a result, in a state of optimism. Optimistic crowd, these early Christians. They were cheerful, they were alert and poised, and the knowing is high and clear throughout all the New Testament after Calvary. Before Calvary, there were sad that would creep in, even into the language of Jesus. As when he said, you know, don't you, that the Son of Man is going up to Jerusalem to be betrayed. There was a sad note there. But after the resurrection, there never was a minor note. They never sang a song in a minor key. Everything was everything had in it the clear ring. There were no cracked liberty bells in the New Testament. They all rang clear as the blue sky. Because they knew that salvation was ready to be revealed, and they were looking for it. They weren't too much they had here because they were looking for something to come. And he said, Wherein ye greatly rejoice that this note of rejoicing was in the New Testament, and it's in historic Christianity. You find it all down. The Christians, they were a singing group, my brethren. I have made something of a study, just to lay from a layman's standpoint, of the other religions of the world. And while they have some poetry, and they do have some songs, they, 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 there's, nothing, there's nothing in any of the great roles that can even venture to be compared with the lyric beauty of the Testament hymnody. We sing in the New Testament, and we sing because we can't help it. They, Jesus came out of all it, and he said, I will sing among my brethren. When he rose from the dead, he sang among his brethren. Paul sang in the prison, and the angel's arm of might smote the prison gates at night. The church is a singing church, and every time the Holy Ghost is, in any period of church's history, they sang. 
They sang among the mystics back in the days of Paul Gerhardt. And Ter- they sang in Luther's time, and the Pope was scared to death of Luther's songs. He didn't hate Luther's theology half as bad as he seemed. Singing themselves into Lutheranism. He said they'll sing themselves into Protestantism if we don't look out. But what are you going to do with a fellow? You can't make him stop. You pull his tongue out and pull his teeth, he'll sing in his heart. And if you sing inside, you're singing. I sing all most of the time inside because I don't want to surround me to the uh, necessity of hearing me sing uh, vocally. So I sing inside. I sing on buses, airplanes, and wherever I happen to be, there's a song inside, you know. Well, now the historic church was a happy singing church. Now, why? Ye greatly rejoice. Well, because of what she was looking forward to. But I want you to notice the contradiction. I've had it said about me that I contradict myself. They say Tozer is self-contradictory. But I want you to know if that is true as a very high compliment because I'm in apostolic succession. Our Lord Jesus Christ was forever contradicting himself. That is, predicting himself. Actually, he never did. He just seemed to. He said, for instance, in one place, don't let anybody in your right hand know what your left hand is. The place, he said, let your light so shine before men that everybody will see it and glorify your Father which art in heaven. Now, you explain that to me, will you? That's a contradiction. Oh, the meaning it isn't a contradiction. And Paul was everlastingly getting up and sounding contradictory. And it's been that way all down the sermon this morning, how what queer birds Christians are what self-contradictory people they are and how hard they are to understand. You can understand them. They're not Christians anymore. And he says here, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now the heaviness. Ye rejoice in heaviness, and you're heavy in your rejoicing. Now explain that to me, will you? You know, now is the time. Now is the time. A fellow told me yesterday on the grounds this. He said he came to my rescue and fought for me, and he heard it, and a fellow said this, he said, if Tozer was ever for anything, he'd have to tell what he wasn't, what he was against in order to explain what he was for. I don't mind that, because, you know, as long as everything's wrong, you've got to be against it. But if it all started right, I'd be for it. If it was moving in the right direction, I'd fall in step and march along. But if the parade is marching over a cliff, I'm going to stand and yell and try to... And naturally, when you're trying to turn the herd, you're, you're, you're on the opposite side of things. And as soon as you go along with the herd, block, for the Lord said we were sheep, not cattle. As soon as you try to turn uh, the, the flock, everybody says you're against everything. Of course, I'm against sin, and I'm against worldliness, and I'm against the flesh, and I'm against Christianity that pretends to be Christianity and isn't this spiritual ignorance that is trying to harmonize Christianity with the world. It's absolutely futile. There was a day when our religious leaders were made fun of and laughed at and opposed, even uh, taken jail or driven out of town or whatever. But nowadays, they're ridden on the shoulders of the mobs and the because they're trying to make Christianity as much like the world as possible in order to win the world. That's the philosophy of the present. I hate to make Christianity like the world. Win them. Show that it's, the, it's like them, only just a little higher. And pretty soon you will win. Don't we know this? That Christianity demands the impossible and secures it. Don't Christianity cut straight across the instincts of man? Don't we know that the message of Jesus Christ runs contrary to the favor of man? And don't we know, as one man said, and he wasn't a Christian, but he just had sense enough. You know, Christians, I, I've given her the dumbest lot that God ever allowed to walk around. I don't know how we ever managed to remember our own telephone numbers. We're so stupid. And we accept any sense of proportion, no vision, no insight, no discernment, no knowledge. And we can be taken in and we put a fat check envelope and send it off to some scoundrel that ought to be in jail. Then we wipe our misty eyes and think we've done God's service. And then people are helping to finance rascals that ought to be in jail and not, not, not to be allowed to be out at all. Poor dumb children, I don't understand them. Anyhow, this man said this, that it is one of the anomalies of history that has had to be converted by the saints that contradicted it the most. Instead of that, we say we make converting with the world and getting adjusted to it. And history shows that they make converts by contradicting the world. 
Jesus Christ stood to contradict, stood to contradict and to oppose. He was a protester and a Protestant, a Protestant. And all the church great peers have been protesters. They've stood in hostility to the times in which they lived, not in harmony with them. And the worst thing you say about a man of God is that everybody loves him and, and they harmonize with him and they, they feel he's a fine chap. Worst thing possible. Now, uh, though ye are in great heaviness, and one version says, even though for a little time it is necessary pain by troubles of many kinds. Now, here we have it. Rejoicing, though pained and in trouble. Now, they were strange people, weren't they? Now, they were in trouble. But remember, my brethren, that the power of the, of the gospel of Christ, the power of the church, always in antithesis and never in its agreements. It always lies in its contradictions and never in its compromises. As a man compromises one inch, he's lost some power. And if he compromises a little more, he's lost a little more power. And rises, he loses progressively more power until finally he has no power at all. And that's what's wrong with the world now. But then a little bit about these strange persons, Christians, these strange people. And uh, when they call you strange, don't let it bother you. Even good enough Christians, they call you a holy roller occasionally. I hope that. When we land people got over being called holy rollers, we got over to characterize our meetings. I don't mind being called a holy roller. The president of a seminary was talking about me the other day, and he said, Tozer is a legalistic sanctificationist. Now, I didn't mind that at all. I, I rather take that as a compliment. I'm a little too popular with some of my fundamentalist brethren. But this fellow, rather, he rather scuttled my ship and sunk me there. He said I was a certificationist. Now, I don't know what either word means, but it's all right because he wasn't on my side. He was against me. Now, uh, just this about a Christian. You wonder why, you wonder why you don't get along so well and why people think you're queer. Well, I'll tell you, if you're a true Christian or a half-saved, then I have nothing to say to you now. Nathan will say that tonight. But uh, if you're a true Christian, I've got this to preach. Notice this about a Christian, that uh, he's dead and yet he lives forever. Now, now that's an odd thing. He says, I have died. I am alive. And the world says, make up your mind, bud. Are you dead or are you alive? Well, he says, I died, but I'm living. And uh, I have death. And the reason I'm alive is because somebody else died. And they say, I knew they were off. I knew that the, that the lid had blown somewhere when they joined that alliance church. Uh, they're dead and yet living. And that the reason they're living is because somebody else died. And the one that died isn't dead anymore. But he, and they're living in the one that is living. And they all, all, all let's go fishing. Let's give it up. There's no use, they say. And uh, you know, brother... If a Christian finds himself uh, at, at home on the earth, he ought to have another dip. Because a Christian, really, did you ever notice a swan down in New Jersey, where I go to preach sometimes at New Jersey, Keswick? They have a big lake, two big lake swans. And these great, big, white swans, particularly the cub, that is the male swan, he'll come out on the bank, chase people away from his mates, chase, their, or chase them away. When he's out on the water, he is a, he is a vision of loveliness. Pure, sparkling whiteness moving along through the water. But when he gets up on the land, he looks like something that was sent for and couldn't be found. He wobbles and he with big old hungover front uh, end bumps on the ground and his legs stick out and he's the weirdest looking thing. But let him get into the water and to look at. Same with a night hawk. You ever see a night hawk down on the ground? He's got little whiskers on the side of his beak and his legs are placed so far that the whole front end of him tumbles over. And he's, the, he's an ugly, awkward-looking thing on the ground. But in the air, at sundown, banking and turning and circling and diving and getting his supper on the wing, he is a, he is a vision of charm and grace. Now, if, if, if a Christian belonged down here, then he'd, be, he'd try to fit in and be grace, gracious and graceful. And, but he does why a Christian is very often awkward down on the world. Christian goes to a meeting somewhere where he has to be, maybe he's a businessman, he has to be, and everybody him a Christian. He's all out of place. He doesn't know what to do. And uh, you find yourself with a group of relatives, and none of them converted, and try to be nice to you, but there's a difference, you know, because you're, you're a swan out on the land. You're, you're, a, you're a bird down on the ground. Christian belongs up yonder, and still he's down here, and there's another contradiction. I ask if he belongs up yonder, why is he down here? 
Well, now, let's look at some more. I notice that a Christian saves his life by losing it, and as soon as he tries tries to save it, he loses it. Uh, if, he, if he seeks to save his soul, he, he, he loses it, and if he's willing to give himself up to death, he saves himself. Now, that's, and yet that's Christianity now, that's it. That's what the Lord says. He said, he that would lose his life, you'll find it, and he that finds it and cuddles it up to himself, he'll lose it. Jesus, our Lord, said that. And then, have you noticed that, uh, that he that surrenders in order to conquer? Everywhere else, they conquer in order to conquer, and when they can't fight anymore, they surrender and give up and admit they're defeated. You can win by surrendering. There was an example in the Old Testament. A man named Jacob lived back there. I always loved Jacob because he was about miserable and more or less, you know, when nature made him, she had a smile on her face and put him together rather loosely. And the crooked old guy that he was and made him into Israel. But I haven't been made into Israel yet, but I'm still in the Jacob state. But, uh, have you noticed that Jacob surrendered on the banks of the Peniel in order that he might win the next day down in the valley? I gave up and uh, said, Oh, Lord, bless me or I won't let you go. He was hanging on the ropes, asking God to bless him. And God blessed him and conquered Jacob. He won over an angry, murderous Esau. And God always has it that way. In the world, they teach you how to inflate your test and go out and tell the world who you are. And the Bible tells you that if you want to win over anybody and, and die and surrender and give up and then go out and meet him, and when you meet him, you fall on your neck and kiss you, the way he thought it is. About these strange people called Christians, that they're strongest when they're weakest and weakest when they're strongest. And if they think they're strong, they think they're weak, they're strong. So the Lord knows, you see. That's why we're so awkward. We're like swans out on the lawn walking around. We bump and waddle, and we just not, we don't belong down here. We're strange people looking for that salvation which is ready to be revealed. Christian again is strange in that uh, he's poor, and yet he's able to make other people rich. And as soon as he gets rich, he stops making other. And as soon as a preacher gets rich, he starts making his congregation poor. And as long as he's poor, he makes his congregation rich. Now, that's a law, and it's a strange law of God. In this world of ours, if you're rich, you make others rich. But in the kingdom of heaven, when you're poor, and Paul said he had nothing, yet everybody was rich around about him. That's the odd thing. Have you noticed that a Christian is highest when he feels, and usually is lowest when he feels highest? When a Christian gets up with his liver functioning and everything going well, and he's feeling well, says amen, and praise the Lord when he doesn't have mean it. And before nightfall, uh, he's dragging the ground. But if he gets up so too much and feels low down and just looks to the Lord and trusts him, he'll make it all right through to the night, and he'll be higher up at night than he was in the morning. Strange. Now, what are you going to do with a Christian like that? Somebody said the church has got two classes of people in it. The bad people who think people who think they're bad. And the better a man is, the less he thinks of himself. You know that? To preach sanctification and they blame you. They think you're sinless. Well, the odd part about it is that the baptism of the Holy Ghost does cleanse us from sin, but at the same time it delivers the thing that we are so that we're always ready to say, I am of all men the most miserable. I am the least worthy of all men. If a man say, I haven't sinned for 15 years, you know you're hearing a liar talking. And as, you hear, as soon as you hear a man or see a man talking about how a great fellow he is, you know that he's missed it somewhere. So that in the church of Christ, the good people are always ready and say, no, no, I'm not good, the Lord is good. But the bad people are prepared to say, yes, you can depend on me, you can trust me, I'm okay. Well, there's the way it is, so that he's most sinless when he feels the most sinful, and he's richest when he feels the poorest, and he has the most when he gives them. Again, we have it. The only, the only example of that I know of in the world is Washington, D.C., and our foreign aid. The more away we'll get more. And we do get more, too. Tongue lashings and cursings from the people we're helping. But uh, back to where I belong. Come in. Now, have you noticed, my brethren, that a Christian always has more when he gives, has less when he withholds more? You never know how much you're worth. They say, how much is a man worth? Well, I don't know. But they tell me the average sized man is worth 90 cents in the drugstore. That is, you can buy his component parts for 90 cents. But since inflation, it's 
So now you're worth a dollar thirteen in the market. That's how much you're worth. But uh, you're you're rich as much, and when God gets it, then have you noticed that a Christian sometimes does the most by doing nothing? That's always hard for me because by nature and temperament, I'm always two steps ahead of everybody I'm walking with. Always up in the morning before others, usually at least. Uh, I'm like that. And I get ready my sermon long before time to preach it. Start for the depot long before the train is due and so on. That's temperament, good or bad. It's just misfortune. But uh, have you ever thought that a Christian sometimes does the most when he isn't doing anything at all? Disciples, come to your part and rest a while. You notice again when the Lord said, Ye shall receive power and go preach the gospel. And Peter grabbed his hat and started, and the Lord called him back. Wait. Peter said, me wait? I never waited five minutes in my life. He said, it's all right, you wait. You'll get more done by waiting than by plunging in. I am fully convinced that if the Church of Jesus Christ were to call a moratorium on all and call a universal retreat and spend ten days waiting on God in penitence and prayer, we'd go further in the next five hours than we've been doing in the last fifty years. We don't wait on God enough. We've got to be active. The magazines, the worldly magazines now, are bringing out articles about why preachers are breaking down. I picked up a magazine uh, on the newsstand on my way here because I wanted to read an article in there written by an ex-preacher. He should have been ex, with the pulpit only he didn't find it out till later. Uh, about why, why pe- preachers are forsaking the pulpit. Well, the men say we've got too much to do. Think what a preacher has to do, and some of you laymen expect your preacher to be that. A babysitter, a midwife, a a tea sipper, and a cake eater, and a golf uh, enthusiast, and a fishing, and a doorbell pusher, and a house-to-house canvasser, and uh, an ecclesiastical administrator, and a poet, and uh, an orator. And he expecting to be all that. Well, nobody that good, bro. I'm like that. The angel Gabriel would flunk that test. And yet you expect your preacher to do all that. And the devil has church. The church thinks it's God, but I know who did it. I can smell. I know where it came from. Just like you smell a new car when it runs off the assembly line, I can smell. The devil knew that if the preachers, the prophets of God, spent enough time in prayer, he's out of business. And so the devil invented a whole lot of things for preachers. And the result is, you poor fellas, rub or run your legs off down to your knees, running around doing things that God never told you to do in the New Testament, and get your orders from Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, and do what you're told and refuse to do what they want you to do. Long of this baloney that them forced preachers to do. I haven't been but one to one or two wedding receptions in the last 25 years. That if I had a wedding Saturday night and then stayed around and heard stale jokes and off-color remarks and all kinds of things up until late Sunday morning. So I married the couple, greeted the, the, the bridegroom and congratulated him and went home, went to bed. Next week. Oh, yes, brother. They just think that you've got to always be busy. But there are times you get more done by doing nothing than you will by doing something. There are times when the Lord calls a stop and says, Come on, come apart, please, open your Bible. Wait, wait there on me and let me talk to you. And then you'll get up from there with a new vision, a new understanding, and you go out to do ten times as much as you would have before. Yeah? Not only are there any new things for us to do, but to find a new subject to preach on. By the grace of God, up to now, up to this moment, I have never... That I was supposed to. I make it. I make it a solemn obligation to myself and God and my congregation, never to preach on the uh, the world says I'm to preach on Mama's Day, for instance. Mama's Day. We're all mamas these days. Momism is captured. In Chicago, everybody runs around, you know, sniffling, blowing his nose. And chances are, when he was at home where Mama was, he was a nasty scarlet. But now he blows his nose and is misty-eyed about Mama. I got up before my congregation this uh, Mama's Day, or this year, and I me for not preaching about Mother, because I said I operate on a commission from God Almighty, and I can't find anything in the terms of my commission on Mother once a year. So I don't preach on Mother. I honor all good mothers. 
But motherhood, motherhood just makes you a mother. And if you're a good woman and you have a baby, you're a good mother. But if you're a bad woman, a bad mother, motherhood doesn't sanctify anybody. Why, well, the cow in the barnyard has a calf. That doesn't sanctify her. That's biological, brother, that cool. And yet we go around and they spend a whole day when they could be talking about Jesus Christ in the glory, talking about mother. And I heard a fellow on the air preaching from the city of Chicago. He told about a dear old preacher. He said to me, we're getting old and sick, and one day he said to me, he said, my friend, I'm old and tired, and I'm to the arms of my mother. Now, this was on Mother's Day. An old guy that ought to know better, didn't he ever read the third chapter of them? When you're old, you can't go back in your mother's womb and be born again. Didn't he know that? But he evidently hadn't. So the next day, and this brother said about him with a catch in his throat, he said he had gone back to the arms of his mother. Imagine it. The Bible tells us Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Not mama's arms, but Abraham's arms. My mother's in my mother in heaven. I'll greet her and thank God she's there. But I'm not going to be a mama. Down on my knees, burning candles tomorrow, that don't let the Boy Scouts, you know, and the kinds of animals weak, and the old maids weak, and all that. I don't nothing to do with it. Well, see, brethren, if you're going to have power, you're going to have to stand in sharp contradiction to the world. And it's wrong in all that it does. It's wrong. In everything spiritual and moral, it's wrong. And the Christian who is, he knows what right is and does that right in the wrong world. And have you ever stopped to think that a Christian's a contradiction in that he's saved now and still talks about the salvation ready to be revealed? And the world says, are you saved? And he says, well, and then the world says, what are you waiting for? And he says, salvation. And the world says, you mean you're saved and still waiting for salvation? Now make up your mind. Are you saved or are you not saved? And the Christian says, yes, I'm saved. But what I have now is nothing compared with what I'm going to have. Think about the salvation that shall be revealed when Christ comes back. And uh, have you ever thought that a Christian was born on the earth and yet is a... Now, I was born in the state of Pennsylvania, and therefore I'm an American citizen. But I was born in the sense of Pennsylvania, and therefore... I was born here and I'm a citizen of the United States, but I was born again and now no longer a citizen of the United States in the same sense. I'm a citizen of another country, Paul tells us. And uh, a Christian is strange in this, that he loves somebody that he's never seen. And is deeply in love with somebody that drops down on his knees and raises his hand and looks into the face of somebody he can't see and talks to him as if he could, but he slips his court. He is talking to somebody. Who is he talking to? Nobody around. But he hears somebody saying, With you always, even unto the end of the world. And he's talking to somebody that's there, only the world looks, doesn't see anybody, and say, What's the matter? The fellow talking to himself? No, sir. A Christian is a strange creature. You ever stop to think that a Christian is afraid of him? You know, it's possible to be afraid of things with a serve all injurious fear, but the Christian has no such fear of God. Up into God's arms because he's God's child. We've had seven children at our house, and there wasn't a one of them ever afraid of me. Never one of them. No, that but what maybe they went a little too far sometimes in their in their liberty. And even my 17-year-old daughter will be 18 next week. Uh, I am afraid sometimes that she could take just a little too much liberty, but she isn't afraid of me, and I'm not afraid of God. And so the Christian said, now, now the world said, now tell me, you Christian, are you afraid of God or not? And he said, no. Do you fear God? Yes. Well, he says, that distinction between fear and being afraid of, but it's not a semantic distinction. That is a distinction of meaning only. It is an actual meaning. The heathen are afraid of their gods. They placate their gods the best they can. They tremble and they die for fear of a curse that's on them. It's fear. Psychosomatic death comes to them. Because they're afraid of their God, but no Christian's afraid of God. He just, he reverences God with a high and beautiful reverence. And at the name of God, he bows his head. God, he keeps still. At the name of God, he rejoices. But always he's free to move into the presence of God. Somebody said when Luther prayed, it was an ex- They said when he gets on his knees at first, he prays with such awful reverence and godly fear that just... That 
But after he's prayed a little while, he begins to break out into such boldness that you fear for him. He wasn't afraid of God. He was just reverent. That. Amen. And uh, have you ever thought that if, uh, if you fear God enough, you don't have to be afraid of anything else? You know why to death about one thing and another? Because you don't fear God enough. Some of you go around and look at yourself in the glass and wonder if there's a cancer form. I'll tell you, I can't give you a cancer cure precisely, but I can give you a cure of fear of it, and that is fear God enough. The Christian that fears God sufficiently afraid of anything. Eh, hey, brother. And then he goes down in order to get up. When he refuses to go down, he's already on his way down. And as soon as he starts down, he's on his way up. Now that's a contradiction I never could figure out. And well, that's why we have such trouble preaching this to people. It contradicts everything they learn, you know, in McGuffey's Fifth Reader, everything they read in the newspaper. But it's a fact that if you go down, you'll come out all right up. But if you go start up, you'll go down. So, and why is this? It's because when you were born, you were born bad. And the only way God is to contradict that badness, upset it, crucify it, destroy it, trample it underfoot, and give you something new inside your heart. Telling us that we got to be philosophers and scientists and they're trying to equate Christianity with philosophy and absolutely foolish even to try it. Because there's no, no similarity to any philosophy in the world full of Jesus Christ. Paul said back in the first Corinthian epistle, that the, uh, the preaching of the cross perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. It's written, I will destroy the wisdom of nothing the understanding of the prudent. I'll tell you this and then I'll close. I told Brother Mason this, and he's here. He can hear it again, but up in Canada with InterVarsity here last fall, and among the preachers there, that is we two preachers and some missionaries and others, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who followed Campbell Morgan in London, is now perhaps the outstanding evangelical of, of England. Sermon on the authority of the Holy Ghost. I didn't know what I was going to get into there when I met this man. But I haven't got over that sermon yet. And here's a, well, some of the things he said. He said this. Through history, the Holy Ghost has been sovereign in his church, and he won't let anybody else be sovereign. He takes all the authority and demands it, and if you take it away from him, he'll desert the church. He said, now history has shown that down through the years, down through the... Whenever the church, the evangelical church, got into a low state, needed a revival, usually a lot of learned brethren said the trouble with the church is were not respected intellectually. So they began to write very heavy intellectuals to try to show that Christianity and philosophy were pretty close together. He said, he, he told about the different movements that had tried that. Every single instance, God ignored them, poured the Holy Ghost out on some simple people and sent his revival. The Oxford movement and sent the Holy Ghost on the Wesleys and the rest, and thus they had their revival. Now, there's a movement today abroad, names, but I hope you're well-read enough to know who I'm talking about. And they're my friends, too, my friends. But they have the, our trouble is we're too ignorant. The trouble you people is you don't have enough gray matter. And uh, that Christianity's losing because we don't have enough gray matter. We haven't uh, enough education. And they say that if we, from the standpoint of philosophy, can prove Christianity to be true, we win. Well, they're running high for a while, but watch out. Up just as sure as you live, for the wise man and the great man and the mighty man never had any standing. It's always the simple-hearted man, the lowly man, the humble man, who believes in a Savior at the right hand of God. And you watch it now. You watch it, brethren. I want to stand here to prophesy. God will ignore this neo or neo-orthodoxy, that's part of their beliefs, uh, at least marginal, but it's what I've called evangelical rationalism. Attempt to explain Christianity in philosophical terms. You can't do it, for it can't be done. It is a... And no man knows anything unless it be given to him from God. And the simplest, hardest person in the state of Pennsylvania that believes in God 
and trusts his son will have more understanding of things that matter than all of these learning their great big books. For Christianity is a mystery. It is, it is in this world a contradiction. And it upsets us and backs us down and defeats us, humbles us. And we go forth in the strength of God Almighty. But if we have some brains or we have some money or we have some talents or we have some gifts, as soon as we arrive there, we begin to lose out. And that's it. The evangelical church is trying to be like the world, and the result will be that in another short generation, the evangelical church will be liberal, for we're moving toward liberalism in evangelical circles. But you think that'll be the end of the church if the Lord tarry? Ah, oh, no. Ah, oh, no. The Lord will find some little old freckle-faced fellow with the cab door standing open, who maybe never had much education, and the Holy Ghost will fall on him. And he'll stand the world, not to be taken in by the world and kissed and loved, but to contradict the world and to tell the world it's sin. And that's all I'll bring the revival that we need. But we'll never get it the other way. Well, you're funny. You're a funny bunch. You're like a swan walking out on the sidewalk. You're awkward and queer. You don't belong here, and yet you're here. God wants you to tell this story while you're yet here. One of these days, you're going to spread your wings and go where you Glory to God. And then, like a swan in the sea or like a night hawk in the air, you'll be at home and there. And there won't be an archangel nor a seraph that'll come and look at you and call you crazy. They only do it down here. And the reason is time and you're a citizen of heaven walking on the earth and your strange contradiction. And I pray to God all night until you die. If you ever surrender and give up to the world, you've already lost your power.